as I was growing up at that time, which would have been, I was born in 58, so in the 60s and 70s, I loved my church, I loved the Lutheran church, there was still something missing. Years later, I was able to pin my finger on it. It was the Eucharist, and Christ was present in the church, in the tabernacle of the church, even though I wasn't able to receive him. He was present there in a way that I didn't have in my home parish. Mm, doctrines or, doctrin or doctrinal statements helped to formulate what the Lutherans taught as a body. So when I got to seminary and I started looking and we started having biblical interpretations and defining doctrines, we were always referring back to the formula of Concord, which intellectually I didn't have such a problem because I knew you couldn't just have everyone deciding for themselves what was pure doctrine, but it had to be the church itself with its formula of Concord. But then when you start doing that, then you start running into another problem because now you've just set up a paper pope defining what your doctrines are. So rather than having a living pope, you have a book that is now your pope. So then I started again going back to the church fathers to see what is the nature of the church? What is the nature of the sacraments? If the Lutherans are saying, oh, we can believe what um, St. Irenaeus says, let's say, on the Eucharist that is the real body and blood of Christ after the consecration, well, couldn't we believe him when he was talking about other things then? Well, then quite often they'll say, well, okay, we'll go to St. Cyprian, let's say. St. Cyprian, there's two different versions of his on the unity of the church. They always liked the second one, the revised one, because he took out his references to the Pope as, or the Bishop of Rome, as the sign of unity for the church. My question was then, okay, we can accept, let's say, St. John Chrysostom, whom they, uh, some of the other fathers, uh, Lutheran fathers liked quite a bit. We can accept him when he, we can accept him when he agrees with us. When he disagrees with us, well, then he's in error. When Cyprian agrees with us, that's great. But then you don't want to read this, this, and this because he's in error at that point. And then even people like Irenaeus, who was in the second century, like middle of the first, uh, second century, so what, maybe 50 years after Apostle John died, he was already talking about the unity found within the apostolic succession. He's already talking about the sacrificial nature of the Mass itself. He's talking about the saints with great veneration. All of the doctrines which later would be developed much further through the ecumenical councils or even in the medieval Roman Catholic Church were all there at least embryonically in all of these church fathers. So when I started reading the fathers, it really started opening my eyes that there was difficulties. And I think I was... I also read John Newman. I worked in the library, which is always a dangerous place for anyone to work. By being able to work in the library, I was able to find and have these resources at my disposal, English translations of all of these works of the fathers, as well as Cardinal Newman, and to read a lot of the things he wrote when he was going through his conversion experience and questioning uh, where the church was, uh, where it subsisted. Because one of the things he read, and was you know, very powerful to me, is when he read St. Augustine. And Augustine went against the Donatist, if you remember the Donatists. They were a heretical group that I believe said something to the effect that if you sinned after baptism, you could not be brought it back into the church. If your priest was a sinner of some sort, he could not confect valid sacraments. And Augustine fought against them. And one of the arguments that he had was the church is truly Catholic with a small c, capital C, whatever you want to say, it is universal. Universal in its approach, universal in that it's everywhere present, universal in the sense that it will be for all time and eternity. From that, though, he would question the Donatist, and he said, now, did God come and become incarnate and die for your salvation just for those people who live in North Africa who are Donatist? And because you could identify every little Donatist community, is that really where it was? And uh, John Newman, blessed John Newman, said, you know, he started questioning, can the church really subsist just in the Church of England? Is that really what God intended? And so, of course, by extraction, I said, ooh, can the Church of Christ subsist only in the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, which is basically what my church was saying. And so is, is God really that small? And is that really what he intended? And so I kind of came to the same conclusion, not in the, I'm not in the same boat as Cardinal Newman, of course, because he's such a great in intellect, but you came, I came to the conclusion, you know, once you accept that, uh, 
Christ established the Catholic Church for all time and eternity, then everything else falls, falls into place. Once you accept the church, you have to accept everything that the creed says. And so even when I was in like my last year of seminary, I was really, really conflicted because in essence, my beliefs were Catholic, but here I am about to be ordained for the Lutheran ministry. And I thought, well, but there was still, I mean, I still had a lot of problems with the Pope and the imperial nature of the Pope as I saw it. I still had a lot of problems with intercession to the Holy Mother. And um, even though I could accept the church as found, being founded by Christ, making that leap was very difficult. So I thought, well, all right, I'll go ahead with ordination. It's probably a wimpy way of doing it, you know. I'll go ahead with ordination, and then once I get into a parish, I'll have a chance to study. Well, I was sent then to uh, a small parish in Southern California, in Azusa. I don't know if anyone's been in Southern California to like the LA Congress and that sort of thing. It can be a little wild, don't you think? And a little progressive in many ways. Um, and I came from a very conservative understanding of the church, and my conversion process was bringing me into a very conservative understanding of the church. And I wasn't really finding that in Los Angeles with the priests that I knew. Many of them were rather progressive Irishmen or whatever. And so I was assigned to uh, a bishop and to one of the priests who was supposed to help me in my conversion, somebody who was working with vocations at the time. And he just came right out and said, you know, why do you want to become Catholic? He said, you know, if I had my choice, I would much rather be Lutheran or Episcopalian, but my family's all Catholic. So he said, you need to stay Lutheran. He said, if you want to convert, it's really going to mess up our ecumenical relations. Because, <laughs> I was like, okay. So by then, for me, I mean, I had come to the conviction I needed to be part of the Catholic faith for my salvation. And here I was being denied the sacraments. My confirmation wasn't valid. I couldn't confect a valid sacrament, and I couldn't receive the sacrament because I was within a sectarian body. Um, so I really didn't know what to do. I converted on uh, St. Valentine's Day, according to the Western calendar, in 88, I believe. Okay. Um, so um, that was, uh, when I converted, it was very difficult. Um, Bishop Thomas at the time, and I'll come back to the Catholic Church in a minute, but Bishop Thomas at the time, his thing was, I don't want to convert you if you're intending that you're go only, you want to be a priest and that's it. You know, I don't want you to want to convert, just go from one job to another. He said, do you want to be Catholic? He said, that's the main question. And if you want to be Byzantine Catholic, then with instruction, you can be. I'll confirm you. Um, and then after that, then we'll talk about vocation. Um, but first, I want to know if you want to be a Catholic. And I said, well, all right. And he said, well, the first thing you need to do is you need to fly back to Michigan and face your parents and tell them <laughs> what you're doing. I said, can't I just write them or call them? <laughs> and he said, no, you've got to go back. And he said, that's your first test. And so I flew back and told my parents I was leaving the ministry and I was going to do it immediately and I was going to be, become uh, a Catholic a catechumen. Um, the first thing out of my mother's mouth, of course, was, I'm just glad your grandmother's dead. <laughs> Great. <laughs> this is going well. My sister just kind of stormed out of the room. My brothers, who are not that active, but uh, it wasn't a big deal for them. My one brother was like, well, you're moving from one corporation to another. What's the difference, you know? <laughs> so that tells you where his faith is, too. And my dad was just very upset that it upset my mother. By that time, he had accepted that I was never going to be rich and successful and be able to take care of him the life he wanted when he retired. So it didn't really matter whether I was going to be a Catholic priest or... But he was upset that my mother was upset. Um, and, but, it, you know, after 20-some years, don't they have come around? <laughs> it's taken a little bit of time. But, um, but I mean, it is a big, it, when you take your faith seriously, and it's been the faith of your ancestors for 400, 500 years, of course, it's going to be very much seen as betrayal to turn away from that, you know? And uh, you don't want to do it lightly, and you don't want to see your children doing it lightly, not if you take it seriously. So I perfectly understood. I mean, I kind of expected I'd just be disinherited and, and that sort of thing. So um, actually, I was quite relieved that it, you know, they didn't kick me out of the house and let me stay the rest of the weekend you know, until I had to go back. So I went back, and I was um, confirmed actually just about a month later. And then Bishop said, well, he was perfectly fine with going ahead with planning on the ordination. 
He just wanted to make sure that that was my intention. And so then I started meeting privately with one of our seminary professors. He flew him out, and I spent a couple months with him, and then I went on to Rome and finished uh, one year at the Gregorian University in Rome, where I studied both at the Greg, which is the Roman Catholic premier school, you know, because of the Jesuits, because the Jesuits were very influential in trying to have missions to help convert the Orthodox to the Catholic faith for not for taking over churches, but to try and bring about what our Lord talked about. What was his high priestly prayer? Lord, that they may be one as we are one, you know. And that is the whole goal of the church, that we have unity at one time between all Christians.